of the worst days in my life. I found a lump in my breast. When she said those words, inside my body was like a complete shock. Those days were like going to hell. Every day I'd be sitting there in my office by myself thinking, my wife could die. She looked at me and she was so pissed and she said, don't tell me you understand what I'm going through because this is not happening to you. It's happening to me. One day she woke up and she said, I'm so disappointed that I woke up. I wish I had died last night. It got so bad. I just called the ambulance. You need to get an ambulance to the house right away. My wife was about to go into a war. 22nd of August. 2021 has to go down as one of the worst days in my life. My wife was in her office upstairs and she called me and she said, uh, can you come upstairs for a bit? And I started walking up the stairs and I'm thinking, it seems a little bit strange the way she said this. I opened her office door and I walked in and she says to me, just have a seat here. So I sat on the bed next to her office chair. I looked at her and she just looked at me before she could even say anything. I'm looking at her eyes and I'm going, something's not right. And she sort of took a deep breath and she said, I found a lump in my breast. And when she said that, oh my God, my whole body, there was something that just went right through my body, hearing those words. Right at that moment, I didn't know what to say. I was just feeling so numb. And I looked at her and just waiting to see what she would say. And she says, yeah, but this was about a week ago. And before she said anything else, I thought to myself, a week ago. But I, I kept it inside because I wanted to see what, she's, what she said. But when she said those words, a week ago, I found a, a lump in my breast. Man, there was something when inside my body was like a complete shock. And, and I looked at her and she says, yeah, about a week ago, she says, I felt this lump. And so I went to the doctors and he checked me out and he goes you need to go to the oncologist immediately and she goes I've got an appointment tomorrow and I thought to myself you've known this for a week and you just told me now I mean I didn't want to make a big deal out of it but inside I was angry thinking how could you have kept this to yourself for a week and to me I think she got it totally wrong because she was saying I didn't want to put you through all that mental anguish and I'm thinking to myself is this what you thought that I wouldn't be able to handle it but the way that she said it it was almost like, yeah, you know, I just didn't want you to worry so much about me that I could have died or you got cancer. I'm thinking to myself, this is weird. If I've proven that I can emotionally handle the death of my terminally ill father and my mother, gone through all of that, and now my wife still says, well, I didn't tell you, I've known this for a week. Uh, until we have an appointment tomorrow or the day after, I'm thinking to myself, this is crazy. Why didn't she tell me? Because what she was doing was she was trying to protect me from having such a tough time, she thought, for that period of time until the appointment came. And this is what we all do. We're holding back information, thinking that we're protecting our loved ones. Because if they had that information, maybe they wouldn't be able to handle it. And you're hurting them emotionally by giving them that information. And I think this is a bit of a dilemma because sometimes if we're holding back that information, we're going to end up hurting that person more than protecting them. Because when they eventually find out that you didn't tell them, they're going to be pissed. Like I was, I was really pissed that my wife didn't tell me that she found a lump for over a week. I'm thinking to myself, what the hell, don't you think I could have handled it? I could have been there to support you. And there's no other answers other than the fact that she was trying to protect me. And I'm thinking, I don't need protecting. I'm here to protect you. You should have told me right away. Now, if the roles were reversed, if I went into the shower and all of a sudden I found a lump and then I came out, am I going to book an appointment with my doctor, go see him first and then get the test done, then come back and then tell my wife what happened? I can't see me ever doing that because in my mind to hide all that information and not tell my wife right away it would be so weird in my mind if I found that lump anywhere I just am the kind of person who would immediately tell my wife look this is what I just found I have no idea what this is if I ever said that to her I can just hear her voice saying okay pick up that phone right now and call that doctor right now she'd be encouraging me to to act and not ignore. And the thing is, I would have done the same thing to her. What are you waiting for? Pick up that phone, call the doctor. And she waited, 
but I would have told her immediately. And then she showed me the lump and I'm thinking, holy cow, this is like the size of a golf ball. How did you not even know it was there? And she says to me, she goes, I was using a, a bar soap, so I never checked myself. And she goes, but I knew there's something wrong. So when I went to see the doctor, he goes, you need to go in right away because he thinks it's cancer. And when she said this to me, I was dying inside, but I was trying to keep my composure. I'm thinking like, how do I handle this. I've never had this situation before. And so all I did was I just got up and I just hugged her and I said, it's going to be all right. But inside I was dying. All these voices were coming into my head because I did not know how to handle this situation. Because one minute I was thinking, why didn't you go to those mammogram examinations? Because a few years back she stopped going because she thought that they were doing more harm than good. So on one side, I was hearing this voice saying, you should have gone. But I didn't want to say that to her because that's not exactly going to make her feel good. So I was feeling angry on one side. On the other side, I, did, I, I just wanted to comfort her because I didn't know what was going on. So I gave her a hug and I said, it's going to be all right. And she looked at me and she says, I'm not worried. It's going to be okay. A lot of women have this and you know, they get through it. And I couldn't believe the strength that she was displaying to me. It was a lot more strong, str more strength than I was feeling, but she was comforting me saying, it's going to be okay. One day at a time, we'll see how, what happens when we go to the appointment. So that night, was tough because after I walked out of her room, I went into my office. I couldn't believe what was going on. And I was just thinking, this doesn't happen to us. This only happens to other people. And I couldn't believe, I'm thinking to myself, is she going to die? And I, I didn't know how to handle this other than the fact that I had all these thoughts coming into my head and I was, I was just trying to fight them off to shut them down and say, okay, just wait till tomorrow. When we get to the oncologist, we'll find out what's going on. So the next day, my, my wife and I, we go there. My wife lies on the bed and the oncologist says, well, what we're going to do is I'm going to check you out and then we're going to do a biopsy to find out exactly what this lump is. And she goes, so we'll arrange an appointment so that you can do the biopsy. So while my wife is lying there, she's examining her. She says, yep, this looks like cancer. And that pissed me off so much. I didn't say anything, but inside I couldn't believe I was so angry at that oncologist. It's like, why did you say it looks like cancer when you haven't even done the biopsy? And I just kept it in. And then when my wife got up, the oncologist gave an appointment to go get the biopsy done. And I said to my wife, I said, I can't believe, how can she say that it looks like cancer? She shouldn't have the right to say that until she can say, look, we got the results. It is cancer or it's not cancer. Why did she say it looks like cancer? This this is not right. I was more concerned with the way the oncologist handled this because it just pissed me off because now we're not going to have the results. We're not going to know anything for the next three to five days on exactly what it is. But it's like I've got this horrifying thought in my head that the oncologist said it looks like cancer. I was really angry at the oncologist because I didn't feel, I mean, you don't say it looks like it. Don't say it looks like it. Base it on facts, you, you know? So she got us worried for a week because she said that. I think what she should have done, she should have said, look, I've seen a lot of these cases, but you don't jump the gun until you get the biopsy. So right now, just enjoy the next four or five days. I have, have hope that, you know, everything's fine, that it's not cancer, but we don't know. We're not going to know until the biopsy. That's what I would want her to tell me. Because can you imagine her tell you that that it looks like cancer and then five days later no it's not cancer it's just a lump <laughs> You're like, you got me, but I had a heart attack for the last five days. It's like, give me some hope. It's like, hey, it might not be, right? You know, I was asked, how would you feel if the oncologist came to you privately with your wife in a different room and said to you, look, I just, I'm just preparing you. This looks like cancer. I know we were not going to, we're not going to get the biopsy results for the next five days, but it looks like cancer. I just want you to prepare yourself for when the biopsy results come. So I was asked, would you prefer that? And my answer was, hell no because until you get the biopsy results don't tell me what you think it is because then at least for the next five days I've got some hope that it might not be what you think it is but at least those five days half of them might be good days and half of them might be shit days but there's some hope there and that hope itself could at least you know give my wife a little bit of strength so I'd rather the oncologist never came to me and said this is my opinion I don't want your opinion just tell me when you know the 
the facts. The next few days were so tough because me and my wife, we were talking and having a discussion about, should we tell the kids? And I was saying to my wife, I says, we can't do this to the kids. We can't tell them. I said, because these next few days, they're killing me right now. And I don't even know what it is. I says, if we tell them that they think it's cancer and then we're not going to find out for five days. I says, we've just put their life on hold for five days. We can't do this to them. And then my wife, after the first day, she goes, okay, you know, you're right. Let's not tell them anything. And I felt good about that because I'm thinking we need to protect our kids. Even though our kids are not young. I mean, that kids, one's in his thirties and one's like 28 years old. So they're not little kids. They're grown men. But I felt better knowing that, okay, you know what? We got to keep this, keep this hidden from them until we know the details. A couple of days later, my wife comes back and she says, she goes, you know, I'm not feeling good about this. I said, what? She goes, we need to tell them. And I got upset with her. I said, tell them what? I said, freak them out. We don't even know what it is. I says, for the next three, four, five days, they're going to be sitting there worried, sick, wondering what this is. And she goes, I know, but you know, she goes, I was watching some videos of people that are going, have gone through this. And they were saying that their kids were so angry at the parents for not telling them because the kids felt that they weren't a part of the support that they could have provided for their mother or their father when they go through something like this. And she goes, I just feel so bad that we're not telling them so that they can be supportive and hide this from them. And I said to her, I said, you know what, just give me a, another day or so and then let's think about it. And then a day later, we both decided we got to tell them because that's what my wife wants. So let's do it. So we sat down, we brought the kids over to the house and we told them and it was it was not a good day for any of us but it was great to see that the how the kids handled it they were so supportive so loving and they felt appreciative that we actually told them rather than waiting until the day of getting the results from the biopsy they felt that you know at least we can support you now and after they went home I sat there and I thought did we do the right thing I don't know if we did the right thing at that moment if it was left all up to me I wouldn't have told the kids because I just didn't want to put their lives on hold for the next three to four days. And my wife even said it to me. She said, when I found that I had a lump, I didn't even tell you until I went to the doctors and I got the results because I knew you'd be freaking out inside wondering what it is. And I'm thinking, well, we just, you just did this to the kids after you know that I'd be freaking out. You didn't tell me, but now you want to tell the kids. And she says, I know, but I just learned that the kids might really get upset if we don't tell them. When somebody asks me, you know, why? Why would you keep it a secret for those three to five days? Aren't you saying that your kids can't really handle the truth? Not really, because there is no truth yet. It's all unknown. And so the fact that it was only going to be from three to five days, that's why I didn't want to say anything to them because I just didn't know what it was. It could literally be just a lump. So in my mind, as a father, I wanted to protect my sons. But at the same time, you know, people could say, yeah, but you're just saying you didn't trust your kids to be able to handle or to be able to at least have the chance to handle this situation in life when these these guys are like in their 30s they're grown men so not telling them did you not tell them because you didn't trust them that they wouldn't be able to handle it no I didn't tell them or I didn't want to tell them simply to not have them worry for three to five days because we didn't know the facts that's it nothing else so then we got the result from the biopsy and the oncologist confirmed. She goes, okay, it is cancer, but now we need to do further tests to find out what kind of cancer this is so that we can find out what the treatment is. And so you're going to be assigned another doctor who's a specialist in this field. He's not a surgeon, but he's an actual doctor and an oncologist specialist. And so he'll tell you what the next step is. And so now we had to wait another week or two before we could go to see him. Him, and it was in the middle of COVID. And thank God we got an appointment with him. It was like there was an urgency because of the size of the tumor. It wasn't small. You could see it if she was lying down. So that tells you it was pretty big. So when the biopsy results came back and the oncologist surgeon confirmed it was cancer, that's when everything went to shit. You know, in my head, I'm thinking, oh my God, like we haven't met with the specialist yet about what kind of cancer it is. But now the surgeon has told us the biopsy has come back and it's definitely cancerous. And you know, the craziest thing, it seems so stupid and dumb and crazy. But from the time that we found out that she had cancer, but we didn't know what type
type of cancer it was. And I remember when my mom was told that she had a brain tumor, the doctors told me your mom's brain tumor is so aggressive that she's going to live literally three and a half months and it'll be over. That's how fast that tumor grew. Those two weeks was hell because I'm thinking, is this the same kind of cancer that got my mom? That was so bad mentally, emotionally, because it's like, you're not in control. And I'm thinking to myself, if it's like the one that my mom's got, it's going to be really bad. So when we were told that, that my wife had cancer, but we didn't know yet what kind of cancer. Oh my God. In my head, I was going crazy because I'm thinking to myself, is this the same kind of cancer that's just going to pop up? And before you know it, like she's got a week to live. I had no idea, but we had to wait because it was this time period of them figuring out what kind of cancer this was. And while this was happening, I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, if she dies, what am I supposed to do? You know, because we always used to have this conversation when we go go to a funeral and somebody gets cremated. My wife would sort of say, I hate this. I hate going to a funeral where they cremate the person. It's so horrible. They're putting them into a fire. She goes, I can't. She, and she was saying, don't ever do that to me or my kids. You know, I can't stand that emotionally. It gets me. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh my God, in my head, if you die, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to cremate you or am I supposed to bury you. Nobody in our family has ever been buried. And in my head, I'm thinking, oh my God, this is a dilemma. What am I supposed to do? And I'm thinking, don't say it. Don't say anything right now. Just, I'm just thinking every day I would be going, oh my God, if she dies, if I cremate her, she's going to know. <laughs> right? Or somehow she's going to know, I told you not to cremate me. I told you to bury me. And I'm like, oh my God. Because she always said, you know what? For the people that I love, it would be so nice to be able to go to a place where they were buried. So I'd be able to visit their grave and put flowers there and to sit there at a, at a, on, a, on a bench or a chair and just to be able to talk to them because it's like a place that I can go to. But if you cremate that person, now they're not anywhere. But all I remember is they were put in this fire. She goes, I can't get that thought out of my head. And I'm thinking to myself, how do I bring this up? How do I say it to her? Like I'm thinking, if she dies, what am I supposed to do? So I better have this conversation. And it almost came out of my mouth. Do you want to be buried or do you want to be cremated? I'm thinking, don't don't you dare say that. And I'm like, I can't say it because he was about to come out. And then all of a sudden we decided to go for a walk. And as we were walking, oh man, it was so stupid because I was searching on the internet. You know, I'm thinking like, I know how much cremations cost. I wonder how much burials cost. I mean, how do they do this? I have no idea. And man, somehow that filter between my thoughts and my mouth, the filter somehow must have slipped out and out came up from my mouth. I said to her, I says, do you know how much uh, burials cost? And as soon as he came out of my mouth, I'm thinking, how stupid can you be? Why did you say this? And she looked at me and she goes, what did you just ask? I said, don't worry about what I just asked. I said, ignore that. Let's just carry on with our walk. And I'm thinking, she heard me. And I thought, that was so stupid. Who cares how much it costs? And then the conversation went to, yeah, you know what? If something happens to me, don't go cremating me. I want a burial. And I'm thinking to myself, God, you want a burial? That means I'm going to be putting you in this place that all of a sudden now I'm going to feel guilty. I'm going to have to have to keep going to that place where your body's at. But I know your spirit's not there anymore, but I'm now magnetized to this location. So everybody that loves you, now they got to keep going to that location because you're buried there. And in my mind, I'm thinking, this is the way that we were brought up. You're cremated, you throw your ashes in a river, and then, you know, the person is nowhere on the earth. And then you're sort of like, you're free from having to go to a burial place because you know there's no attachment anymore. And you can literally connect with them through your prayers. And I was in a dilemma. But then in the end, the conclusion of the conversation was, if she wants a burial, I got no choice. Now, if she's buried, Buried, then I'm gonna have to be buried next to her. <laughs> I'm like, then what do we do? Get two for one deal? I'm like, this is the stupid stuff that was happening in my head. Two for one deal. Then what do we do? Get buried on top of each other or sideways? Then what about the kids? Do they get buried? Do they get cremated? And I'm thinking, okay, Terry, you need to just shut up. Stop thinking about this one burial at a time. <laughs> And then I just stopped thinking about it. You know, I've never really had a conversation with my kids about, 
you know, if your mom passes, this is what we're going to do. I mean, we had a conversation about like just lightly, like your mom wants to be buried if she ever, dis you know, if she ever gets the news that she's going to die, she wants to be buried, not cremated. And the kids would listen to that. And um, and then I'd say and they'd say, well, if that ever happened, what would you do? Would you move out of the house? Would you sell the house? Would you go into a condo? How, what would you do? And, you know, it's almost like I haven't gone there because I don't want to go there. I know I've got great kids and I've got a great sibling family with an enormous amount of people that I love and they love me back so I never have to worry about that side but it's really difficult to go to a place where you're actually sitting there thinking okay if my wife died I would do this I would do that I'm not there yet because it was like I don't want to talk I don't want to think about that right now because it's not a good feeling to think about that and so I don't take myself there but the only thing is I know every Everything's gonna be okay because of my kids. They're all totally financially secure. I'm financially secure. We have no issues with it, with money, but it never is. It's always to do with you know people's feelings. And because I see other people, you know, their wife dies, and maybe they're elderly, and next minute, you know, the father is stuck by himself in a house, and now he's moving into their basement, and it's almost like I mean I see these kind of things. You know, people people are busy living their life, and so in my head I'm thinking. If my wife ever died, do I get stuck in somebody else's basement? Do I stay in my own house? Where do I go? You know, how long would I live for? And then all of a sudden my mind just says, stop thinking about that because just love your kids and just think positive. And when the time comes, things will naturally work out. But I didn't want to, I haven't gone there yet. And I don't want to at this moment. And literally my wife and I, we would, we would say to ourselves, it is what it is. We constantly keep saying that to us. It is what it is. We don't know what it is. And it is what it is. So every day, one step closer to the day we find out what kind of cancer this is, was an excruciating emotional pain. Those days were like going to hell. Every day I'd be sitting there in my office by myself thinking, my wife could die. It was such a tough situation. And I didn't want to show my wife how I was thinking thinking and feeling, I needed to be there for her. But man, it was so tough because I would go into my office and I would sit there and I'm thinking, how am I going to handle this? And in my mind, I couldn't stop the thoughts. The first thought was I kept hearing, your wife's going to die. She's going to die. This is it. It's over. And I, I couldn't get that thought out of my head that this woman that I've been with for 36 years is now going to die. I'm thinking this only happens to other people. This is this was never supposed to happen to us. We're supposed to grow old and have grandkids. And I'm thinking to myself, it happened. It's happening right now. And I didn't know what I ha how to handle it. And uh, so the only thing that I could do was go into my office, shut the door and pray. And I opened up my journal, my prayer journal, and I had to pour out my heart to God. And I wrote everything that I possibly could write about how I felt, telling God that I need you. You know, can you help me? How do I handle this situation? And then I wrote what I felt in my heart that God was actually saying to me in this situation, the toughest situation I've ever been in my life. And I'm going to read to you what I wrote that day in my prayer journal that I felt that God was trying to tell me so that I can understand this situation better. And here it is. So this is what that I felt God was saying to me in this terrible time that I was going through. My dear son, if I could heal your wife's sickness, I would have done it already. Why would I want my children to suffer? My heart is also full of sorrow for Rani. But please understand how the physical world works. I can't heal, but you and Rani can. Please understand all the suffering and pain in the world. If I could stop it, I would. But it doesn't operate that way. Please understand that in the end, everything will work out to be okay. This situation and so many others around the world like this. Think of how many women get breast cancer. How many don't heal and pass on to the spirit world. But some do heal. I am not a parent that picks and chooses. My love for my children is such that everyone, every single one of my children are precious. But the fight is yours to fight and grow through. Just like when you were in your mother's womb. How 
how can she help you? She can't. She can only empower you. Even though I am your heavenly parent and my heart breaks every time I see my children suffering, I can't intervene. But you can pull my power into yourself and empower yourself. I am here. You are never alone, but you will get through this. Use my words, access my power, pull it in. You can heal yourselves through my power. I hope you can understand this. When two of my daughters get cancer and one lives and the other passes onto the spirit world, I did not choose who lived or died. The cancer cells themselves are also living organisms. They are also trying to live. The lion and the deer is also choosing who lives or dies. It's not always the strong survives, but it seems that way. When Jesus was on the cross, I couldn't stop it. When True Father had pneumonia, I couldn't stop it. But we can and will always come out stronger and better on the other side of the tragic situation. Use my power and wisdom. Win the battle and whatever happens, know that all will be okay in the end. I will make sure, I will always make sure my children are okay in the end. But the journey seems so cruel sometimes. Please understand and be hopeful. Fight and use the situation to grow. There is never a situation where pain and suffering doesn't elevate your spirit. Use the tools to fight. Prayer, fasting, spiritual assistance, medical doctors, medicine, mindset, love, diet, attitude. All these are weapons against any illness. I am with you no matter what happens. Everything will be okay. I am also doing what I can, but there are heavenly laws that allow everything to work for the better. Rani's fight and your fight with her. Use this to love each other more, to be examples of strength for others. You will inspire others and give hope to them through the way you handle this. You can do it. I know you will worry. You will have fear. You will cry. You will be sad, disappointed, angry. It's okay. Everything will be okay. You're not alone in this battle. I am with you every step of the way, every hour, every minute and every second. I am here with you always and forever. It's okay to cry, but don't worry. You have me and you will never lose each other. There is a bigger picture that you will see one day. It will all make sense. You and Ronnie are examples. Be the best examples in this fight. Show your love to each other. Show your family your strength and love. Your mother and father are okay after all they went through. Never worry. You have me beside you every step of the way. So my dear son, what is your game plan now? So after I wrote that, I started thinking to myself, what is the game plan? How am I going to handle this situation now? These are the things that I decided to do. Number one, I needed to be there for my wife. I needed to love her, support her, care for her in a way that she feels the support and love not the way I want to give it, but I got to be there for her 24 hours a day, no matter what. And this was tough because at the beginning, I was saying to my wife, everything's going to be great. You're going to make it. It's going to be good. You know, you, you're, you're going to be able to tell other people what you went through. You know, I understand what you're going through. And when I said that to her, she looked at me and she was so pissed. And she said, don't tell me you understand what I'm going through because this is not happening to you. It's happening to me. And when she said that, I, I sort of backed off and I thought, man, it was like she just bought me you know, gave me a good punch in the face, but I understood that I needed to listen. She said, I just need you to tell me that you don't know how I feel and that you're, you're there for me. That's all I need you to say. Don't give me this motivational pep talk because I know you don't know how I feel. So from that day on, I knew I'm not going to be doing that again. I just go over, give her a hug, be there for her, hold her hand and tell her, look, I'm here with you. What can I do? And that's all she needed. She just needed me to shut up and listen to what she had to say so she can get the feelings out. So that was my number one game plan. I needed to be there for her in a way that she needs me to be there, not the way I wanted to show my support. The second thing that I had to do, which was part of my game plan was we needed to trust the doctors. I needed to listen to the doctors because they know what they're, what they're doing. They treat hundreds of people all the time. So obviously they have the exact knowledge of what to do. So I had to trust the doctors, but I needed to find out what kind of questions I need to ask them. So I did some research in figuring out 
What kind of questions should I be asking the specialist when we go to see him? Because we know it's cancer. We just don't know what type of cancer it is, but I have to trust him. I have to trust the fact that they know best on how to handle this type of cancer, whatever it is that they're going to tell us about. The third part of my game plan was I needed to stay close to God. I needed to pray because I didn't know where else to get the strength from. So what I did was I went online and I pulled every scripture that talks about healing and support from God when you're going through tough times. And I wrote them all down because I needed to get that positive feed into my head, knowing that I'm not going through this alone, trying to support my wife, that God is with me, guiding me on how I can help my wife. And some of the scriptures that I got off the internet from the Bible were like things like this, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The second one, come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. And one more, when Jesus heard this, he responded, don't be afraid, just keep trusting and she will be healed. I had a ton of these scriptures all together and I would read them every single day because I needed to have in my head that connection with God giving me the power to be able to give that love and support to my wife. So prayer was so important. And the next thing was I knew in a few days we're going to find out what kind of cancer this is. So I needed to do whatever I could possibly do to influence this this situation. And I knew it's not only prayer, I'm going to have to fast because I always read that prayers become so powerful when you fast, it takes it to the a next level. And in my head, I kept hearing, you need to fast. So I decided to do a two day fast. So I didn't eat anything for 48 hours. I just drank water. And every time I would normally have a meal, instead of eating a meal, I took my scripture cards and I would read them over and over again for an hour instead of eating a meal. So I did this throughout two days. There was nothing else that I could do. It was not in my hands anymore. I could only do the things I knew that I could do. Love my wife, trust the doctor, in medicine, pray fast. That's it. That was the only things that I could per personally do. Those were in my hands. The rest were in God's hands and in the fight with the medicine against the cancer. So then the day came, we went to the oncologist, the cancer specialist. We sat down, he had all the results in front of him and he sat there and he told my wife and me and he said, look, it is cancer, it's stage two. And the guy sat there and he goes, look, I've seen this many, many times and I just want to let you know our goal with this cancer is to cure it. The word that I was looking for is when he said, look, this is curable. Our goal is to cure this. As Soon as he said that, I'm thinking to myself, okay, this is good. He's not freaking out. He says, I see this all the time. The one you got, you're lucky you got this one because this is the one that we can attack. And man, when he said this, I thought to myself, okay, I feel good now to a certain point where the doctor's actually saying our goal is to cure this. He's not saying, look, there's no hope. You got like a year, two years, three years. That's what I was thinking he was going to say it considering the size of it. And he said, it's stage two because of the size. And he said, I don't think that it went into the lymph nodes. It doesn't really show that it did, but we're going to remove one or two of the lymph nodes just in case there's something there that we can't find. But he goes, most of it is contained. And so we need to do the full treatment. We need to do chemotherapy, eight sessions so we can shrink the tumor. The second thing is then we do surgery to remove what's left. And then the third thing is the radiation. And he goes, that's the order in which we're going to do this because the tumor is too big for us to just go in and do the surgery first. And then the treatment started. But then when we walked out, at first we felt relieved that, okay, it's curable. But then we started thinking, holy cow, chemotherapy. This means you got cancer. This is what I was thinking in my head. You got cancer. And the fact is there are people who have this and the chemotherapy doesn't fully work. So anything could happen. But at least 
least we had that little bit of hope that they, their goal is to cure this because they know how this reacts. So we did feel better. And then the journey started of the treatments. I remember just before the oncologist told my wife that she'd have to go through eight sessions of chemotherapy, we had a conversation. It was about whether my wife wanted to do the chemo or not. Because at this moment, we didn't know if they were going to say you need to do chemotherapy. And my wife was saying, I don't know if I want to do it. And we had this discussion because she was saying, look, my aunt was told that she had cervix cancer, that she was going to die. And to prolong her life, they were going to give her all this treatment, chemotherapy and all sorts of whatever they had to do to try to prolong her life. And she said she was in agony. She was just saying, you're going to get me to die ill in this state all the way until the day I die. If I never had all this treatment, I would have at least enjoyed some of the months without this medicine going into me and making my life even worse. And she kept seeing that about how her aunt just one day she woke up and she said, I'm so disappointed that I woke up. I wish I had died last night. It's another day of being ill. And she used to say to me, I don't want to go through chemotherapy. I don't want to go through that stage. And I'm thinking to myself, are you crazy? You got to do this because they said it's curable. If she had refused chemotherapy, I know that my sons and myself, we'd be so mad. We'd be doing everything we possibly could to convince her to do the chemotherapy because of the type of cancer she had. And thank God she went through it. So after we came back from the oncologist, the oncologist said, when you have your first chemotherapy session, we're going to give you a little bit of a higher dose just to find out how much of this chemotherapy drug you can actually take. And so he's said, if it doesn't work out that well, if the effects are a little bit too drastic, let us know and then we'll cut it down. So the first chemotherapy session she went on, she came home, everything seemed to be fine. But then all of a sudden, it's like the shit hit the fan. She was lying in bed and she goes, I don't feel good at all. She went into the bathroom and man, she sat on the floor and her face was like white as anything. And her head was going round and round. And she goes, I just feel terrible. Then she gets up and she's puking in the sink and as she's puking I mean everything's coming out but I couldn't leave her and I'm the sink is getting filled with this stuff and I'm just taking it out and throwing it into the toilet while I'm supporting her as this stuff is happening to her then eventually get her back in bed and while she's lying there I'm looking at her I'm going man this does not look good and it got so bad that she had the shakes she was going white as anything and it was just so bad I I just called the ambulance and I said, you know what? I don't know what's going on here, but um, you need to get an ambulance to the house right away. And because this was the first session and it was like, we, we had no idea. And then we ended up in, in the emergency. It was there for like six hours. And uh, they said, look, the dose may have been a little too high. So tell your oncologist the next dose should be a little bit less, but everything's fine. We've hydrated her and all of her vitals are all good. And then we came back home and man, that was, an experience because I'm thinking holy cow this is just the first chemo session because what I had found was when the chemo goes into your body there's a whole portion of that chemo that stays in your body then the next one goes on top of that then the next one goes on top of that and I'm thinking how bad is this gonna get and but that was the first one and it was like a wake-up call I'm thinking Man, it's like my wife was about to go into a war with this thing that she, they're pumping into her to try to kill her. And it's a matter of like, who's going to survive? And I'm looking at this and I was I felt so helpless. I'm like, what do I do here? And uh, after a day or two, you know, she was up on her feet. She was walking around and it was like the chemo, that initial chemo hit sort of like phased off and she got her strength back and she's walking around and it was going to be like another one or two weeks before she gets it again. I remember when my wife was going through the treatment, she was getting the chemo and I don't know how many sessions she had had. And she says to me, I can't take this anymore. She goes, I would never, ever do this again. If this cancer ever comes back, I would never do this. And I was just sitting there listening to her. And she was so angry and so fed up of what this chemo was doing to her. Because she would go into the bathroom and she would look in the mirror. And she would see herself in terms of losing, the, losing so much weight. Losing everything about her. Her eyebrows, her eyelashes, all her 
hair, you know, having sores in her mouth and um, all her nails fallen off. And she's looking at herself in the mirror. And every day it's like somebody's erasing her and she can't even recognize herself. And she says to me, I would never do this again. I would rather just die and live those months that I have left to live without having to go through this crap that they're putting into my body. And I'm sitting there, I was speechless because I'm thinking, yeah, but this is going to prolong your life. But it was so bad for her that she literally was so angry. I'd never do this ever again in the future if this ever happened to me. And um, throughout the entire eight sessions of chemo, she never took any time off work because it was COVID. She worked from home. She was on the phone and she was on her computer working every single day while she was going through chemo, while she was going through everything. And I kept saying to her, why don't you take time off? She goes, I can't. I have to keep working because this is the only thing that takes my mind off the chemo, the mind off this cancer stuff. If I don't work, I'm going to drive myself insane sitting on the couch thinking about what's happening to my body. And while this was all happening, I mean, in my mind, I'm thinking, holy cow, she's a trooper. But on my side, when I go into my office, I'm thinking, what do I do? I didn't know what to do. And it wasn't like I had nobody to talk to. I'm not the kind of person who all of a sudden is going to phone a family friend or uh, a personal friend and tell them how I'm feeling because I don't really feel alone because of my spiritual background and my relationship with God. I've found a way that I can get the pressure that's inside of me, all that, that anxiety that a normal person would feel. I don't feel that anxiety because I've got a way to get it out. So I actually sit down and take out my prayer journal and I write as though God's sitting right there listening to me and as I'm pouring out my heart then I'm writing what I think God's telling me and it's so therapeutic that literally after like 20 minutes or 30 minutes of writing in my prayer journal all that anxiety is gone it's like everything's come out and so I never really needed to phone my brothers or sisters and tell them you know I'm really feeling down and stuff there was only one thing that ever bothered me and that was if my wife dies I would feel so alone that was the most scariest thing that I went through and it felt terrible but the only thing that kicked me back into hey everything's gonna be fine is when I opened the prayer journal and I was able to tell God this is how I'm feeling I'm feeling lonely I'm you know I'm feeling that if she dies I'm not gonna have anything right like in terms of like the comfort the relationship I'm gonna lose everything everything that I'm living for. I'd say that in my prayer journal, but then all of a sudden I'd feel that God's talking back to me saying, that's not the case. Everything's going to be fine. And then all of a sudden I'd feel so much better. So it was literally like a personal counselor that I could go to by myself in my office. And I know so many people, they don't have this release. They don't have this system that I personally had. And I had this for years, even when my dad went through his terminal illness, that was the way that I was able to get all this stuff inside out to be able to then go and uh, be with my wife and support her with a clear head and with some strength that it'll, it'll be okay. And you know, people have said to me, they've said, you know, why do you pray if God's not going to intervene and just heal your wife just like that? Why do you pray? Because God's not going to just intervene and fix everything in the world. Prayer is our effort our human portion of responsibility that makes things happen, that actually can heal somebody. If we just sit back and do nothing, then we're not using the power that God's given us. So even though God himself is not going to just heal my wife, there's a chance that my effort in prayer, that can actually cause the healing to happen. All I know is if you don't pray, nothing changes. But if you do pray, you can actually cause things to happen. How that happens, I don't know. But it's a spiritual way through your effort, your mind, your focus of actually praying. Spiritual things start moving in place and that's when healing starts to take place. So that's why when I got the answer from God, 
God and he was saying, look, it's not me healing. You need to pull the power. You need to pray. You can make a difference here. It's your effort. Don't just wait for me. And that's why I knew every day that I had to do my responsibility, which was praying and one step further, which was fasting. That was going to help my wife if it was going to help my wife. If I didn't do any of that and I just sat and waited, then it could have actually been in my hands and I didn't do anything. So I had to do everything that I felt was in my hands. And when I pray to God, I always say to him, look, if you're waiting for my prayer to act, to be able to do something, then I'm giving you my prayer. I'm praying right now that if you are waiting for me, I have the faith that you can do this, then I'm doing it rather than just saying, well, I'm not even going to pray. I'm not even going to make that effort. If God wants to heal my, my wife, he'll heal her. It's not the way I believe that th that happens. I have to make the effort. I don't know if it's going to work a hundred percent, but if I don't pray and fast, but it needed my prayers and fasting, then I screwed up. So I'm going to do my portion of responsibility. There's nothing else that I know that I can do. So I'm going to pray and I'm going to fast because if that was what was needed and I didn't do it, then I missed out on that opportunity to, to heal my wife or to get healing for my wife. So I knew whether prayer works or not, I'm doing it. Whether fasting works or not, I'm doing it. Because even if there's a small chance that my prayer makes a difference, if I don't do it, that doesn't make any sense. So I'm playing all my cards. I am praying. I am fasting because I will do whatever is in my power to be able to do. That's my effort. So I have to do it. And I know people are listening to this and they're thinking, prayer sounds hokey hokey pokey kind of stuff. Well, then don't do it. But then you'll have the guilt that if you had done it, maybe the healing would have taken place. And in my case, I'll tell you something. I believe in prayer. I believe in fasting. I believe in medicine. I believe in the doctors. I believe in love and support. And a year and a half later, my wife today is 100% cured. The cancer is gone. The tumor is gone. She's had mammograms and they've shown that everything is gone. Whether that's healing through my prayer my effort, the medicine, whatever it is, I don't care. But I'm thankful that I trusted the doctors. I trusted the medicine and I trusted God to be able to pray and have his strength. And I fasted and I read my scripture. I did my part. There was nothing else that I could do. And thank God it worked. And even now, like literally two years after this cancer ordeal, I still think to myself, how stupid of her not to tell me right away. Even though she says to me, well, I didn't want you to worry. I'm like, what do you mean worry? What? I'm here for you. You're supposed to be able to tell me this. You're not supposed to sit there and think, well, I don't want to worry you. What? You just going to worry yourself? This is what we're in for together. We do. We handle things together. So even today, two years later, I still don't accept that answer. Oh, well, I didn't want you to be worried until I found out more detail. Inside, I'm thinking, that's a stupid excuse. <laughs> I'm here for you. You should have told me immediately, just like I would have told you immediately. But I've forgiven her because I know she did it because she didn't want me to worry so much because I'm a, I'm a very emotional person, meaning I always tell her how much I love her and I'm affectionate. I'm always hugging her. Maybe, I don't know, maybe she thinks that's a sign of weakness that, okay, if I tell, and yeah, I sit there crying and bawling my eyes out when I watch movies, you know, when there's something sad going on. So maybe she's thinking, if I tell him about this, he will sit there bawling away in his own private office, <laughs> which will never happen because I'm not living my life by myself. You know, I have the greatest invisible friend, which is my spiritual relationship. So I wouldn't be doing that, but that's fine. If she thinks that it's okay, but I'm still pissed that she didn't tell me. The craziest thing is after she's gone through that and now it's been almost two years and she's literally fully recovered physically. It's not the physical battle. It's 
all emotional because even in the books I, I was reading, the YouTube videos I was watching, they were all saying in the end, it's not the chemo, it's not the drugs, it's not the surgery, it's not the radiation. It's the mental games that this whole journey puts you through. It's what you're thinking inside, how you're changing, who you're becoming, how you look like you're just, you're already dead. The emotional battle is the biggest killer in this kind of disease. And during the chemo, she was, she was getting really kicked around. And the greatest thing is, you know, after two years, I see her talking to people voluntarily about her journey. And I'm sitting there in awe, listening to her, thinking, is this the same girl that literally a, a year and a half ago was saying, I can't go through this shit. I'm never gonna do this again. And now I'm sitting here listening to her and I'm thinking she is so strong and she is talking to people and giving them strength and hope. And I'm like, she changed. She grew so much. And I'll tell you, she's the strongest person that I personally know. So even though she went through such a huge physical battle, my God, emotionally, mentally, she's a giant because she is so tough. And I remember this one time she says to me, I went into the, where all the patients are waiting for the, to see the oncologist. She went in there, she started talking to this woman who was going through chemo and she had lost all her hair. And, and my wife started talking to her and she's, the woman started sharing stuff. And then at the end of it, my wife says to her, uh, can I get your number? You know, maybe you can, you know, you can advise me or, or tell me what, you know, how things could be a bit better. And the woman said to her, I'm sorry, I can't get Give you my number. You need to talk to the nurses. When my wife told me that, I thought, how rude of this woman not to give you her number so that this way she could help. And then after we had a discussion, we came to the conclusion that this woman that she had met, she was still going through it. She didn't even know how to handle it herself. And the last thing she needed was to try to give hope to somebody else when she didn't even have hope for herself. And she was telling my wife, look, you need to talk to the nurses. Those are the ones that know every patient and their journey of what they've gone through. They know how to help you. I can't give you advice because my journey may be totally different than yours. And then I remember my wife at, at the towards the end of the chemotherapy session, we go back to the oncologist and we're sitting in that room and uh, my wife now has had the eight chemotherapy sessions and now she's about to have surgery and stuff and we're looking at other women that are coming into the room for the first time and my wife's looking at them it's almost like boy that woman has no idea what is about to happen and I'd be sitting next to her and we'd be looking at these new ladies and there were some guys there too and it like literally broke your heart thinking that person has no idea what's about to happen to them. But thank God we're in this country. We're, we're in this system. In the middle of COVID, they were able to give all these treatments to my wife to be able to solve this devastating illness. We just were so blessed. But it's like from that time, from the beginning to the end, and when I say the end, I'm talking about all the, the treatments are over. My wife has grown so much mentally, physically, so much more stronger than I am emotionally. Man, I saw how many needles they gave her. I could barely take one needle and I feel faint. And I would have to think about what she went through in order to give myself strength to be able to take one needle just to get my blood test. So yeah, I'm really proud of the journey that she's gone through. Hopefully we never have to go through it again. You know, I'd always joke with her. For years, I used to say to her, I says, you know what? I says, if you ever died, I'd never marry. And she looked at me and she goes, what? You're gonna live on your own? You need somebody. I said, no. I says, if I, if you died before I died, I says, I'd never get married because once we got married, I says, you're my wife on this earth and in the spirit world for eternity. And she goes, aren't you ever gonna give me a break? She goes, yeah, I'm married to you here on earth can I at least have some alone time on the other side and I'd say no I can't see myself ever getting married if you die I would never do that because I know that when I die I'm gonna see you and we'll be together forever I says but if I die I said to her now don't go marrying anybody but yeah you can have companions you can have a friend, but don't get married to anybody because once you die, you're gonna join me on the other side. So we, we always have these funny conversations, but deep down, 
for me, you know, I look at marriage as a spiritual thing in the sense that if I married my wife, it's forever. It's for eternity. That's in my head. That's in my heart. It doesn't matter if it's in her heart or in her head. That's just the way that I feel. And we've had this conversation many times. I'd, I'd say to her stuff like, yeah, you know, if I ever die. And she goes, are you still talking about death and spirituality and going to the other side? I said, yeah, because you know what? It doesn't scare me. She goes, well, I don't like talking about this stuff. But the thing is, I like to talk about this stuff because I want to always be prepared. I want the kids to always think, you know what? Dad was never scared about going to the other side. Because I remember once when my dad was, I would say, about a year before he died and he was going through his terminal illness. I said to him, I looked at him right in his face and I said, are you ready to go and meet your granddad? Because you always talked about his granddad. And he looked at me and he goes, yes, I'm ready to go. And you know, I never understood that because when I asked him that question, are you ready to go? Go. And he said, yeah, I'm ready to go. He ha he was not joking. I mean, he was he had the most serious face saying to me, I'm ready to go. I don't need to stay here anymore. And I, and I didn't want him to say that because I wanted him to say, I want to stay here as long as I could so I can see, you know, your kids get married and them have great grandkids and their kids. And it was almost like, no, I don't need to see all that. I've seen enough. Our family is big enough. I'm ready to go. And I couldn't relate at the time, but I've grown up since then. And to me, it's like if all of a sudden if I'm if I'm ever you know in a, in a position where I'm told you're gonna die it's like hey my bag's been packed for a long time you know, like, it's like what what am I gonna do if, if it's my time it's my time I'm not gonna sit there and go oh my god I've been told that I'm gonna die in six months so I gotta change the way I'm gonna live my life no I'm living my life the way I want to live my life if I was gonna die in three months or six months I wouldn't change anything I'm living the way I want to live in terms of relationships relationships with people. I wouldn't say, oh, you know what? I'd stop everything and then I'd spend more time with my family. I'd go visit this person. I'd talk to this person. I'm doing that already. So that's the way I always wanted to live is not change my lifestyle because I'm told that it's about to end. I want to live my life the right way and I'm doing it as best as I can now. And that is building relationships. And that's why I'm very close to my wife. I tell her whatever is on my mind. You know, I don't hold anything back. Sometimes I got to keep my mouth shut, but we talk about a lot of different things. Years ago, I watched this movie called The Notebook and uh, spoiler alert, if you haven't watched this movie, I'm going to tell you the ending. But right at the end, when the wife dies and she had Alzheimer's, just before she died, her husband went into her bed in the hospital and lied right next to her. And by the morning, they had both died together. And when I saw this movie, I thought to myself, that's the way I want to go. The two of us, you know, I want to die with you. And I used to think this way. I, I used to think this way for a long time. But then when my spiritual relationship with God got stronger and stronger and stronger, it took me to a point where I can literally say if my wife dies, I wouldn't be in a situation where the grief would overtake me to the point where I'd say, I can't live like this without my wife. I, 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 I wouldn't go there. And I'll tell you why is because with my thinking now and my spiritual background, I see the world and my life much bigger is to me is I know that when people pass away, I know they're going somewhere. They're going to a place where I'm going to see them again. But while I'm alive, I've got to use my body and I've got to use my mind to do great things in this world to help God change this world for the better. There's no point me if my wife dies or my kids die or any of my family members die for me to emotionally break down to the point where I say, I can't live anymore. I'm in such grief. I'm in such sadness. I know that there'd be a certain amount of time where that would be happening. But in my mind, I've gone beyond that. And I understand right now it's not happening to me, but maybe this is all bullshit that if it ever happened, it'd be different than what I'm trying to tell you. But I'm, I'm telling you right now at this stage, it's like I talk to God in my prayer journal and I'm saying to him, tell me what you want me to do. How do I make a difference to other people? I don't want to just live on this earth and say, I've had a great time and then off I go. No, I want to I want to make a difference. Tell me what I have to do. If my wife dies, okay, fine. She, she's died or somebody else has died. I'm going to see her later. But until then, I want to make sure my life has 
meaning. I want God to be able to use me to make a difference in other people's lives. So it's like I can't see myself sitting there grieving in sadness, you know, for an extended period of time. It's like, okay, God, what do I do next? How do I how do I take this situation and help other people get through this and move to the next stage? Because every great person that has ever lived, all the spiritual founders and saints and great people in the world, they went through tremendous tragedies in their life, but they had this vision of how God wanted them to change the world. And that's where I am at this moment in my thoughts that I've got a bigger plan beyond just being attached to my wife and my kids and my family. I'm trying to do something big with my life.